Hey, good morning and welcome to Church at the Well. My name is Tony and I'm one of the pastors here on staff and it's my privilege to welcome you to our online service today and into this Advent season. Advent, that's a word, maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you aren't. It's an old word and it means coming or arrival. And this is the season every year that we as followers of Jesus celebrate the reality that God himself has come. He's arrived into the world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And in fact, more than that, the reality is he's, kind, he's constantly coming. He's constantly breaking in and arriving into our lives, showing his goodness and his love. And even more, we know that one day we have a promise that Jesus himself will come again. He will arrive to make all things right. Everything in the world that we know that is not quite the way that it is meant to be. Things are not all right. We know one day they will be because he will come again. And what we're calling this Advent series this year is joy actually. And we're going to be looking for and searching for the reality that joy, because Jesus has come, because he's constantly coming, because he, he will come again, joy is constantly breaking into the world, even into the midst of all of the things that we would say, these are not reasons for joy. These are struggles. These are hardships in life. The reality is because Jesus has come, joy has come along with him. And so over the next few weeks, as we lead up to our Christmas Eve service, we're going to be exploring the realities of the joy that we have in Jesus because he has come, because he is coming, and because he will come again. And so with that, let's get into the rest of our service.
together, church. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, he holds a victory. Hey church, welcome to the first Sunday of Advent. It is the Advent season. The season where we prepare for and anticipate the arrival of Christ at Christmas. Now, even if you uh, didn't grow up in the church or you didn't grow up in a church that actually um, you know, observed the Advent season, if it's kind of new to you, <laughs> we all know and are familiar with the idea of anticipating Christmas. Like, here's the thing, on November 1st, you got to walk through the store and buy discount Halloween candy and Advent calendars. And instead of being tempted to open the Advent calendars when you got home, I'm talking to the adults here, you got to eat the discount Halloween candy and nobody would know the difference, right? Mixed in with all the other stuff. No judgment, (laughs) right? Christmas season, in a sense, is upon us, or at least the anticipation of it right from the beginning of November, which is amazing. Now, we are pretty good at kind of uh, anticipating Christmas or anticipating what we might get, the gifts we might get at Christmas. In our house, the tree is up, which means some presents started to appear. Now, when you look at kind of presents under the tree, you can look at stuff like this and go, um, you know, I'm not going to shake this because this is actually one I found under a tree, so I don't know who it's for. It might be for me. But when you're a kid, uh, the bigger, the better, right? If it's big present, oh, your eyes, like you look at that thing and think, oh my gosh, I can't wait. That looks like it's going to be an amazing present. Now, when you get a little bit older, 
you look at smaller presents, you think, oh, that is good, right? That's maybe technology or jewelry, right? Like, so now I'm thinking, okay, when I bit, get a bit older, I think, oh, that looks like it's going to be a good gift. Definitely want what's in that. Then there are some that are like, ooh, they're soft. It's clothes. You're like, no, grandma got me another sweater, <laughs> right? So you're like, no, this, I don't want that. I, I, I'm, I'm not even going to shake that. I know what that is. And then there's this, which clearly is a book, which can I just say for on behalf of all the kids, nobody wants a book for Christmas, okay? Now, I know some of you are going to write me emails after this and text me and say, no, I do. What? You're in the minority. Like a book. Another time. You know, the day after Christmas, give me a book. But on Christmas, don't wrap a book and put it under the tree. We all have an idea of like, oh, that looks like it's going to be a good present. Or that's not going to be a good present. Brown paper bag under the tree. Now, if it's covered in grease... All the East Indians and uh, West Indians and Guyanese people know there's samosas in there. So that is a good present. But I'm just saying, generally, we can look at it and go kind of the wrapping the size we think that's a good gift. That's not a good gift. That is not something I would want. Now, take a moment. The people you're with or if you're on your own, just reflect on this question. What is the best or worst? Sometimes that's more fun to share. What is the best or worst gift you've ever received at Christmas? Just take a minute and talk about that together. Now, hopefully you're not sharing that with um, the person who gave you the worst gift ever, but you can sort that out. Sorry if I've caused some family problems after church. Now, here's the thing. The gift we can probably all expect or anticipate and say, well, yeah, for sure that will be under the tree this season is joy, right? I mean, joy is probably the word that is most synonymous or connected to the Christmas season, the thing we anticipate getting the most. Now, however you define that, whether that's happiness or delight or enjoyment, peace, whatever, a combination probably of all those things, kind of a deep sense of, yes, this is what I wanted. This, is, this feels good, all the feels. However you would define that, that is something that we would all say, yeah, yeah, we want that and we can expect that, can't we, at Christmas? After all, maybe the most definitive, uh, beautiful, powerful declaration or promise that we find in the Christmas season, if you've read it in the gospel, three of the four gospels uh, of uh, the biographies of Jesus that describe it, or maybe you watched Christmas with Charlie Brown and you heard these words, good news of great joy for all people. Good news. Good news that will bring what? Joy, great joy for everyone. That was the promise, the declaration of Christmas. Joy to the world is the songs we sing at this time of year. And yet, if you read actually these biographies, these stories, these accounts of the first advent, the first season that anticipated Christmas, the first Christmas, the people themselves and the circumstances they were in were surrounded um, by things that did not look like what they had asked for for Christmas. They did not look like joy was wrapped up in what they were receiving, in what they were finding out, in what they were dealing with and living through. It didn't at all look to them like joy. And yet this pronouncement over the whole Christmas season, good news, great joy for all people is what was given. And so we're going to take the next four weeks because even though our lives 2000 years later are very different circumstantially, we still find ourselves in a place where we need joy. And maybe we can say it, man, more than ever, more than ever. Perhaps you've found out things or received things that you say, I didn't ask for that this season. For certainly the pandemic is one of those things we'd say, oh, I didn't ask for that for last Christmas and I was really hoping it wouldn't be around by this Christmas. But perhaps in your own situation, maybe you got news that was not good news. It was not great news at all. And it robbed you of joy. Maybe you got a pink slip, you lost a job, or you got a note or a text, email, phone call saying, I need to tell you something. 
Maybe you got a rejection letter for a job you applied for or a school you wanted to get into. Maybe something has happened that you say, I didn't want this. I didn't ask for this. It's not on my Christmas list. And not only has it not brought me joy, it's robbed me of joy. And so we find ourselves in a sense uh, in a situation where we are desperate for this good news of great joy. And so the next four weeks, we're going to actually be looking through the Advent season, the Christmas story to find out how people 2,000 years ago whose situations and circumstances and lives did not look like they were receiving joy were in fact recipients of that promise. Good news, great joy for all people. And we begin today with a story of someone who was plunged into a set of circumstances overnight that suddenly seemed to threaten their joy and they didn't know what to do about it. I want you to listen to this account of how they found out this news and what this news was. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. This is definitely a story of, I didn't want this for Christmas. I did not ask for this. This is the story of Joseph, the father of Jesus, finding out some news that to him would have been devastating. Now it says, just to understand a bit of the context and why, it says that this man Joseph was pledged to be married to a woman named Mary. Now, what does that mean? Well, those are the days when your parents arranged your marriage for you. Some of you would still like to live in those days. Mostly the parents would like to live in those days, but anyways. That was really, it was a conversation between families and families that lived in extended families and villages together. So it was very kind of a public familial thing where the one family would, because if they were the kind of the same social status and they knew each other and there was honor, you know, both in the, in the girl's family and the husband's family, like they would, you know, uh, r- arrange this deal and say, okay, we will pledge our daughter to marry your son. Um, And that pledge would be for, you know, like it's a promise that this is going to happen. But this wasn't just like, hey, you know, put a ring on it, you know, if you want to marry me. Um, The pledge was kind of like marriage itself. To break the pledge was actually akin to divorce. It would have been the same thing. So this was a, a very binding agreement, a promise between these two families that their two children, husband and wife, were going to marry each other. Or they would say in the old kind of ancient Near East that a family would give their daughter in marriage to the son of another family that they knew. And it was um, assuming both people were honorable and good and certainly as Jewish people honored God. All of that would have been in place. Mary and Joseph wouldn't really have known each other very well, but they would have been part of the broader family connected to each other in different ways and relatives and all that stuff. And they would have then engaged in this marriage relationship. And Joseph gets a visit from Mary with some news. Hey, Good news. Great joy. I'm pregnant. (laughs) I don't think she said it like that, but that was part of the beginning of the Christmas story promise. Um, But she would have said, wait, don't, don't react. Don't worry. It is good news. Um, I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. This is a miracle of God. I'm not pregnant the way any other woman on the face of the earth up to that point and since then has ever been pregnant. This is a miracle of God. No man was involved. To which Joseph says, pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's not a thing. I do not know what that is. I do not know what that means. I can't even imagine what he thought. He would have just thought, well, I didn't expect Mary to lie to me. And that is the most bizarre excuse I've ever heard in the world. He's just going to assume at that point she cheated on him. She broke her marriage vow. She was not the honorable woman that she seemed to be or that her family portrayed her to be. She cheated on him. That's how she got pregnant. And so now he's stuck with this news. And it was sort of um, a... a you know, plunged upon him. He didn't know. He suddenly finds himself in this situation and he has to decide what to do. You know, is he going to carry through with the commitment? Um, Actually, it says he was faithful to the law, which meant there were really only two things, uh, one thing to do, which was to divorce her. In the old days prior to Roman occupation, she might've even been stoned to death, like killed. 
but the Romans uh, did not want any of their occupying peoples to have the right to the death penalty. And so they were not allowed to do that. So he would have had to divorce her. That was the right thing to do. There was no thinking about it. It was like, well, I know what needs to be done. She's not an honorable person. She hasn't been faithful to the marriage vow. So I need to, and that's why it uses the verb divorce. I need to break off this relationship, divorce. But he decides, okay, but I'm going to do it quietly. Like he's making a good thing. It says he, he made up his mind to divorce her quietly. There's no way this is a good thing. I can tell from a long way off, this is bad. There's nothing about this that feels good or right. Certainly that would promise joy. And so he's going to do the thing that will hopefully help him come out clean. You know, he's going to divorce her, but do it quietly to spare her and probably to spare himself or his family. So that added shame. And someday down the road, some of his friends would joke about it and say, Hey, remember when you almost married that girl who was unfaithful to you, who gave you that bogus excuse about being pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Whew, that was a close one, Joseph. He was going to come out clean. She would have to live with the shame and figure out what to do. But he knew what he was going to do. He was moving in the opposite direction. Which we can sort of relate and go, yeah, that's not at all what I would have hoped and what I wanted. And even though chances are none of us have ever been exactly in his shoes, we can relate to the idea of getting news that we go, no, that is not good. I am moving in the opposite direction of that. I'm going to do anything I can to get out of it. Uh, avoid that, move away from that. That's not joy. That doesn't hold goodness for me. That is not good news. I don't want that. Here's what I'm going to do. And so Joseph decides, this is what I'm going to do. And we can relate not to the circumstances, but to the feeling of saying, no, that doesn't look good. I can tell from a long way off. That's not what I want. I did not ask for this. Here's what I'm going to do to get out of it. And so Joseph decides, this is what he's going to do. And then he falls asleep. And listen to what happens as he sleeps. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Joseph makes up his mind what he's going to do. And it actually says here in my translation, maybe you have this in yours, after he had considered this. And that word considered means after he had decided this. He knew what he was going to do and he went to sleep. <laughs> and in his sleep, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him, which the angel of the Lord in many ways throughout scripture is synonymous with the Lord himself. And so read this as God inserting himself into Joseph's situation, into Joseph's decision-making. And he says to him, don't be afraid. Mary's not lying. This is actually from God. This child is a miracle of God. So he's already decided what he's going to do. I know what this is. I'm heading the other direction. This is not what I want. This is not what I asked for. This is not going to bring me joy. There's only one option. And God, while he sleeps, inserts himself into Joseph's decision-making process and says, stop. I want you to reconsider. Don't be afraid. This is something I am doing. I am in this. God is at work in this. And because of that, he tells him to, to, to do two things. Marry Mary <laughs> and name the child. Marry Mary and name the child. He says, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Do not divorce her. Do not send her away. Do not break off this engagement. Take her home as your wife. In other words, follow through in your commitment and she will become a part of your family, a part of your household. She will, in a sense, take on your last name, your household name. She now belongs to you. And he says, name the child. Now, before we get to the names of the child, the idea of Joseph naming the child, this wasn't just like, hey, you don't get to decide his name. Here's what his name is. 
Joseph naming the child would be an act that said, this child is mine. This child belongs to me. Him taking Mary home and naming the child were in a sense two steps of the same step of action and ownership and saying (laughs) the exact opposite of what he wanted to do. He wanted to move away from this thing. He wanted to get out. He was like, no, I don't want any part of this. And God says, no, I want you to actually move towards it. I want you actually to double down on your commitment. Bring Mary home as your wife and name the child as your own. This is your son now. That's why he had to name him. That was the significance of it in the ancient Near East. Joseph wants to move the other way. And God says, no, I'm in this. I want you to move towards it. It was the opposite of what Joseph wanted to do. And yet Joseph decides to obey. Joseph decides, right? God inserts himself into Joseph's decision. Joseph had already decided what he was going to do. God says, no, I want you to rethink this. Here's what I'd like you to do. And so Joseph changes his decisions in order to obey God. Which would have been incredibly difficult and risky. It would have been difficult in his own mind just to get over the reality of what he was dealing with and saying, okay, I have no proof that this is true. I had this dream. Maybe I just ate a burrito too late last night. And now I'm supposed to take, okay, this was difficult even in his mind to comprehend that God was actually doing this, that someone could be pregnant without uh, another human being being involved. How could this happen? But he was actually signing himself up for a life that would be difficult. Because he knew now forever that this pregnancy, people would, it would become pretty public soon, at least public to a small group of people, that Mary was pregnant. And some people would know it wasn't his child. And he would actually have to deal with the shame and the stigma around this, as as would Mary. But as the man, in many ways, the shame would have fallen on you, or how could you marry this person, or how could you do this? And we know, actually, that the rumors did not go away or the idea that this is not his son. In fact, if you read later on in the biographies of Jesus, at one point, some of the religious leaders were trying to discredit Jesus. And you know what they said at one point in an argument with him? Well, at least we know who our father is. Whoa, right? That was a comment to this very situation saying that idea had existed all the way from the beginning of Jesus' birth that he didn't really know who his father was that Joseph wasn't his actual father, his real father. That stigma lived with Jesus all the way through into his 30s, and therefore it would have with his household and his neighborhood, the whispers, everything. So for Joseph to do this, right? He wanted to get out and get clean from this and get away from this. When he, he decided to obey, he was moving towards something more difficult, more risky, more complex. But he trusted God enough to obey. God inserts himself into his decisions. I say, he says, yeah, I know you've decided this, but I want you to decide this. And here's what I want you to do. And Joseph trusts God enough to obey. And it, it, it invites him into an experience of joy that he could have never seen coming. Right? Like there's no way he saw the joy that was, oh, this is going to be a great decision for me. No, all he saw is, okay, I'm going to obey you, God, but this is going to make things more difficult, more risky, more complex for me. It's not like he saw joy coming, but it was a kind of joy on the other side of that step of obedience that he could have never imagined. And he couldn't see it, but Matthew, who's writing this biography, he gives a little clue as to what that joy would be. You see, when when the angel comes to to Joseph and says, you're going to name the son, he says, name him Jesus. And that word means uh, God saves or he who saves because he's going to save his people from his sins. That's what you're going to name him, name him Jesus. But Matthew writes in, in his editorial comment, yeah, but they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is what Joseph was going to name him, God with us. And that, my friends, opened the door wide for Joseph to experience a kind of joy he could have never imagined. This was the gift that Joseph had no idea he was receiving. 
something that looked like it was nothing he would want, nothing he would choose that would only hold complexity, risk, difficulty, shame for him to obey. And he obeys and it opens the door for him to actually receive the gift of joy he could have never imagined. And that gift was the name that was given to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Now that name, Emmanuel, if you look in the Old Testament, the Israelite people would have known that name of God, God with us, but more in the sense of like, okay, God is generally with us in kind of a spiritual mystical sense. Sometimes maybe they would have seen a glimpse of a cloud or like a pillar of fire and that was God with us, but that was all they knew. Joseph literally got to experience God with us. He held him in his arms. He sat with him at his dinner table. God with us worked alongside him in his carpenter shop. You think about it this way. Joseph had more face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus than anybody on the face of the earth, right? Because from the time Jesus was eight, he probably would have been learning his father's trade. We know Jesus actually in the early years was a carpenter and he learned that from his father who was a carpenter. And Jesus was a carpenter, really, practicing that from the age of eight all the way up to 30. And we don't know at what point in his life, how old Jesus was when Joseph died. But for much of those years, think about that. Every day in his carpenter shop, every day at his dinner table, even more than Mary, Joseph got to experience God with him more than anyone on the face of the earth. The joy of experiencing God with us that Joseph could have never known was coming on the other side of this step of obedience because he trusted God enough to follow through. And think about this. Joseph, who chose to save his son from being raised in a, in a, in a home without a father or even worse, Joseph, who chose to save his son, was saved by his son later. Joseph, who showed, chose to show grace to this child that was not his own, would raise a child that would eventually show grace to him because he was the son of God. Joseph, who chose to say to that son, you are mine. That son would eventually grow up to say to him, even today, Joseph, you are mine. That is a joy Joseph could have never anticipated as God interrupted his decisions and invited him to choose something else, as he trusted God enough to obey him, even when he couldn't see what was on the other side, he would have had no idea the kind of joy that was waiting for him. He literally experienced God with him. And friends, the same promise exists for you and I that there is joy to be found when we allow God to interrupt our decision-making, to give us his idea of the world, his direction of where he is leading us. When we trust him enough to actually obey, that word obey, which we use associated with children, right? Well, we used to, now we just ask kids what they want to do, but we used to actually ask them to obey. We don't associate it with adults at all. It doesn't sound like a great word. And yet this is the invitation that God gave to Joseph. Trust me, obey me. And on the other side of that decision was joy. And so I want to do something here that we have done from time to time as a church. And that is just have a little bit of an auction. Because <laughs> there are some things here that I believe are for each of us in some way. I don't know everyone who's watching today. I don't know everyone who's here today. I don't know everyone who's tuned in today, but God does. And there may be something in this, in this story, in this journey that relates to exactly where you are. That is something God wants to invite you to do today. And so I'm going to read three different things. And as I read them, this is how an auction works, right? In an auction, you go, hey, I want that. Now, here's the beauty. We can all take it. It isn't just one person who gets to go home with this today, right? And you don't need any money to participate in this auction. What you need is faith and desire and say, yeah, I want that. And so as I read this out, and I know some of you are watching online, you're at home, or you're watching uh, at one of our sites this week, you can just yell out. I want you to yell out. You're like, you're at an auction. You're like, hey, I don't want any. I want that right? Or that's mine. However you want to do it. When I read it out, I'm going to call you out and say, if you want that, you just put it up and say, yes, that's what I want. For some of you, this is what you want and need. This is the gift. Letting God influence our decisions so that he can lead us 
with wisdom. Redirect any foolish or selfish plans and help us align our will with his will. Okay, to let God influence our decisions so that he can lead us with wisdom, redirect any foolish or selfish plans and help us align our will with his will. Who wants that? Just shout it out saying, I want that. I want that. That's mine. You just call it out. You claim it. That's yours. Okay, for some of you, it's this. Trusting him enough to obey him even when it's hard, complex, mysterious, or costly. Trusting him enough to obey him, even when it's hard, complex, mysterious, or costly, with peace in our hearts and a quiet trust in his goodness and wisdom. How many of you want that? Some of you say, yeah, I want that. That's mine. I need that. Today, that's mine. It's yours. And then this believing that God wants to bring joy into our lives and that on the other side of trusting obedience, joy is in fact waiting for us. Some of us, this is what we need. It's the belief that God wants to bring joy into our lives and that on the other side of trusting obedience is a joy that is waiting for us. How many of you want that? Call it out. I want that. (laughs) So good. So good. You know, that name that was given to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Yeah, in a sense, Joseph experienced that in a totally kind of fresh way, in a real way, in a face-to-face way that maybe nobody else ever has. But that same promise exists for us, that God is with us. (laughs) That in the same way, in an intimate way where we say to him, you are mine. (laughs) Just like Joseph said to the child. And that Christ says back to us, and you are mine. We belong to each other. That is what is promised to us, God with us. And so we're going to close with a song that just talks about love coming down to us and saying, God, I am yours and you are mine forever. And so let's sing that with kind of a fresh, um, a fresh perspective to saying, yeah, that means that is the joy that we have that God offers us. And whatever it is that you claim today in the auction, maybe as we sing this, just pray, God, make this true. I know you love me. I know I belong to you. Make this a reality in my life. Yeah.
As we bring our service to a close, we don't want to let you go without letting you know about a few important things coming up in the coming days. First off, our Christmas Eve service that's happening on Friday, December 24th. There's going to be live in-person services at each one of our sites. Vaughn will be at 3 o'clock, King City at 4.30, and Bolton at 6 p.m. We hope to see you there as it will be an amazing time to celebrate the birth of Jesus and everything that means for our lives. I also want to let you know about the week of prayer, which is coming up um, at the very first full week of the new year. It's going to be beginning on Sunday, uh, January 2nd, and we'll go for five nights uh, straight that week up until Thursday, January 6th. Every night we're going to be gathering, and this is a practice that we do. If you've been part of our church for uh, any length of time, you'll know that this is one of the highlights of our year where we commit to beginning the, the first full week of every year by coming together as a community to pray, to seek God for ourselves, for our own lives, for our families, for our church, but also for our communities and the world around us. We want to ask God to continue to break in and work in his power and in his love and in his goodness in so many ways as we look to the year ahead. It's an incredible way to start the year, friends, so I want to encourage you even now to mark each one of those days off on your calendar. Some of those gatherings will be in person, some will be online over Zoom, um, but either way, we're going to be gathering together to ask God to work powerfully among us in the year ahead. Friends, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for taking part in our online service. I want to bless you as you go into your week that joy will go with you.